All right, let's get started. Welcome everybody to Blender Workshop 6. Uh, this week we're going to be covering a basic introduction to the fundamentals of animation inside of Blender. Um, so we're going to be covering what kinds of things can we animate in Blender, how do we animate in Blender, um, we're going to be covering the three main animation windows in the uh, Blender interface and how to use them on a you know on a basic level, um, and then at the end we're going to be covering um, how to do like the most basic animation in the world, just a rubber ball bouncing across the floor. So, first things first, um, what kinds of things can we animate inside of Blender? And the answer to that is pretty much anything. Um, any input you see in the Blender interface, sliders, toggle buttons, text inputs, almost all of them uh, can be animated, which is pretty cool. Um, the most obvious um, and easy to demonstrate to them would be the transforms. So we got the ball selected here in our in our world, and in our object properties we have our transforms. Over to the right we have these little dots, and if we hover over them we'll see that it says animate property. So if I click on one of the little dots, the property turns yellow, the dot becomes a little filled in diamond, and we get a diamond down here in the bottom left in our timeline. That little diamond is a keyframe. Um, and we'll cover what keyframes mean uh, momentarily as we go forward, but let's go ahead, let's grab the playhead and move forward to frame 30, um, at which point you'll notice that our property turned green. I'm going to change this to 1, and then the diamond here is hollow. Let me click it, and now it turns filled in, and we went from orange to yellow on our property. Um, so the colors are changing here. What do the colors mean? The colors are important. Um, so there are four colors that a property that is being animated can be in Blender. Obviously, if it's grayed out, it's just a static property, it's not being animated at all. Um, but the other colors that it can be, if it is being animated, is yellow, green, orange, and purple. Um, purple I'm going to bring up and then, you know, put away really quickly. Um, purple is kind of an advanced thing. Purple means that the property is being controlled by a driver. A driver is a kind of super advanced feature inside of Blender. It's basically a way of programming properties to be driven, hence driver, by um, functions and formulas that you set up which create relationships between different um, variables or different properties of different objects inside the of your project. Um, so mechanical um, animators who set up really complicated mechanical rigs, um, as well as character animators, will use drivers to do super advanced special things like have um, the position of one object affect the rotation or the color or the scale of another object and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Um, we're not going to be covering any of that advanced stuff um, today. We're not even going to be getting into like um, setting up skeletons and armatures for character rigs. In this one, we're just going to be focusing on the fundamentals. So um, if you ever open up a Blender project and you see a purple property, just know purple means um, there are drivers there. And so whoever made the project has set up some like crazy advanced relationships between that property and something else. Um, the three other colors are the ones that you're going to see most of the time, yellow, green, and orange. Yellow means that the property is being animated, and our playhead in the timeline is currently sitting on top of one of those keyframes. As soon as I move the playhead here, the little blue arrow thing, as soon as I move the playhead off of a keyframe, it turns green. Green means this is a property that's being animated, but I'm not currently sitting on a keyframe. And you can also see this by the fact that our diamond turned from filled in to hollow over here. That's another indication. But not every property in Blender has one of these little dots, um, which we'll cover uh, a little bit in more uh, momentarily. But hollow and green, it's being animated, but it's not on a keyframe. Orange is basically a warning. Orange means this is being animated, and you change the value without saving it. So either it's not on a keyframe at all, so as soon as I move the playhead, it snaps back to whatever it should be, or even if I'm sitting on a keyframe, um, unless I have automatic keying turned on, if I change the property, it doesn't immediately save that I changed the property unless I um, lock it in. So as soon as I move the playhead, it will go back to what its value was. Even if I changed it, 
I have to save that I changed it unless I have auto keying turned on, which we'll cover again momentarily. Um, so what other properties can we change? Um, what about properties that don't have those little dots? Like in my modifiers panel, I have a subdivision modifier to make my sphere smoother. Um, could I keyframe one of these properties? Well, yeah, you can, even though it doesn't have one of those little diamond dots that you know indicates that you can animate it like that. You can still hover over it and tap the hotkey I, as in India, and that will set a keyframe. So if I tap I over this property, I get a little diamond in my timeline, and the property turns yellow. And if I scrub forward, it turns green. Cool. Um, what about like our material properties? Like, could I change the color to change over time? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I can start here. It's red. I tapped I, so now it's highlighted with that little yellow outline, telling me that I've got this keyframe. Scrub forward a little bit, change it to blue. Tap I, went from orange to yellow. Scrub forward a little bit, change it to green. And we went from orange to yellow. Um, obviously with the color slider, it's a little bit harder to tell because it's a faint outline instead of like the whole background of the slider being filled in, but you know, it's still there. Um, I really like that Blender gives you that visual indication on properties that they are being animated and what the animation state is, um, because I've used software in the past like 3ds Max where you can add keyframes to a lot of different properties, but it doesn't give you any of that. It doesn't give a highlight. It doesn't give any visual feedback besides the keyframe and the timeline that you've actually successfully changed that property. Um, so now, if I scrub through my timeline, it goes from red to blue to green. Awesome. Um, so the basic idea here, um, if you haven't caught on yet, these keyframes, these little diamonds, are like fixed moments that we are marking for properties. So at the beginning here, at frame one, our location is zero on the x-axis. And as we go to frame 30, it changes to one on the x-axis. And in between those two key frames, those two uh, times in our timeline that we set the properties to, it transitions the ball between those two states. Um, and as we go into our dope sheet, and especially our graph editor, we'll show how we can change the uh, the way that we transition between the keyframes um, to make it faster or slower, or or to do fancy things with those transitions. Um, but basically, keyframes are our fixed points where an animation hits hits its mark, uh, hits a hits a specific value. And we can add those, as I said, to basically anything, any property that we can hover over and highlight in the interface. Just tap I and see if you can animate it, if you want to try to animate it. There are very, very few properties in Blender you can't actually animate, which is awesome. Um, so the, the first uh, section of the interface we want to cover really quickly, let's expand the timeline, obviously, here, is our timeline. So our timeline is like the most basic way of previewing our, our animations. It gives us uh, a rough overview of our keyframes. It gives us some play controls. It shows us you know, our, our in and out, our start and stop frames for the animation. Um, and then we can do stuff like add markers, which are, um, let's go ahead and cover these. Markers are basically notes. So if I add a marker, you'll see that F20, it just names it by default, the frame number, the frame name. So let's go ahead, rename this marker to something like um, ball is moving, hit OK. And then over here, when the ball starts to change color, maybe we'll go and add a new marker, rename this marker, say ball changing color, hit OK. And so basically these are like sticky notes in our timeline. Um, as you get into bigger and more complicated projects, you're animating lots of objects at once, your timeline will become a massive mess of tons and tons of keyframes, lots and lots of these little diamonds all over the place. It can be really cluttered, really messy, hard to, hard to understand at a glance. And so markers are just super useful ways of um, setting, giving us a uh, little sticky notes to reference back to later of what's going on. They don't, they aren't actually keyframes. They don't actually affect any of our property values, um, but they're just 
notes, human readable comments, notes, um, which are useful. Uh, as we go to the middle of our interface here, we have our play button, so we can play forward, pause, we can play backwards, pause. Uh, next to them, we have a little play arrow with a diamond, that means jump to our next or previous keyframes. And then the ones with the lines is jump to the beginning or the end of our animation range. So the range here, stop at frame 1, end at frame 250. If I play, it will just loop in a circle. And if I were to render out this animation um, as, like a, as a, like an image sequence or a, uh, a video file, it would render out from my start to my end frames as like that's the, the section of our timeline that we actually care about. That's the bit that we're actually animating. Um, obviously, our keyframes don't extend between both of these, but that's our, our, you know, our specified range. Uh, next to our play buttons is this little dot called auto keying. Uh, I did mention briefly that um, uh, unless you have auto keying enabled, when you change a property and it turns orange, it's not going to automatically override one of your keyframes. Um, if I do click auto keying, and you'll see it becomes highlighted blue now, I can start grabbing and moving, and it will automatically set keyframes for where I just moved that ball. Um, some people really like auto keying, uh, I, probably especially for character animation, so you can just start grabbing bones and just move them where you want them and automatically get keyframes as you're trying to basically move your character around like a mannequin. Probably super useful. Personally, I'm not a big fan of auto keying because there are times where I'm moving objects around just to, to preview changes, but I don't want to lock in that change um, until I manually hit I on my keyboard and, you know, set that property as, as changed. Um, and there are times where I'm like moving stuff around and I'll accidentally, accidentally add a bunch of keyframes I didn't mean to. Um, so I'm going to leave it off for the purposes of this tutorial, but um, it can be useful. Good to know what it is. Good to know it's there. Um, and then as far as moving around in our timeline, if I click and hold with my middle mouse, I can scrub side to side or up and down. And if I scroll the mouse wheel, I can zoom in and out on the timeline. Um, the one other thing that can be useful to know in uh, our timeline is, so if I go over here to my uh, render output properties, you can see I've got my same uh, frame start, frame end, and I've got my frame rate. My frame rate here is 30 frames a second. So for every 30 frames in our timeline, one second will have passed. You can change your timeline to show seconds instead of frames. So now I've changed it to show seconds. So this is one second. And I can change it. Now it says 30 frames. Um, this can be useful if you're changing frame rates and you want to make sure that you know the, the timing of the animation remains the same, even if the frame rate of the animation is changing. Um, but most of the time as an animator, you pick a frame rate and you're going to work in terms of frames, not in terms of seconds explicitly. Um, it tends to be a little bit more human readable and friendly than, than seconds um, for most animation circumstances. Um, because you're dealing with keyframes rather than like a smooth interval of seconds, um, if that makes any sense. Um, so then we're going to jump over to our next animation window, which is the dope sheet, which is basically a more advanced timeline that gives us more controls over our keyframes. Um, so I'm going to go over, click the little carrot over here to the left, which opens up our summary, our little uh, outliner. And our outliner gives us basically all the objects and all the things that we have animating in the scene. So I've got the ball is being animated. Under the ball, I've got this action for the transforms. And I've also got this little action for the, uh, the shaders, the, the material being changed. Um, actions, we won't really be covering here, but um, one of the other windows, uh, animation windows, um, we mentioned drivers. Uh, the driver editor allows you to edit drivers. We're not going to cover that. Um, we also have uh, non-linear animation, um, which is where we get into this like action thing and the action editor with the dope sheet. Um, 
we're not going to cover it. It's more advanced, but as a basic overview, um, when you're animating objects in Blender, you're usually animating into, you're always animating into an action. An action is like a block of keyframes. Um, and you can create multiple actions and animate those actions. So uh, if you think about a character, you might have an action that is like the, the loop of their run cycle. And then you have an action for them punching or swinging a sword or you know pulling out a gun or any of those kind of actions depending on you know the animation you're making you can create these animation or these action blocks and then in the non-linear timeline you can string those blocks together like you'd string together uh, clips in Premiere Pro or DaVinci and create complicated animation sequences made up of those individual little animation blocks um, so if you're or if you're if you're making um, animation sets for a video game like reload animations for a gun uh, you might have a, a recoil animation uh, a reload animation an empty reload animation when the gun is empty um, an aim down sights animation and each of those little animation uh, segments that you'd uh, trigger in the game will be its own little action uh, block in Blender. Um, for now, we're just going to be animating in the one timeline, in the one action, and that's all we're going to worry about. Um, most of the time, if you're just doing a single animation, you're not worrying about creating big animation sequences, you're just going to animate into the one default action, and that's all you need to worry about. Um, but wanted to introduce it and mention it very briefly. So. In the dope sheet, we have some more advanced things. Um, we have the ability to change properties about our keyframes. So we can change um, the handle type, which will make more sense when we get over to the graph editor, but we can change the handle type. We can change the interpolation mode. Um, and then we can do weird things like extrapolate keyframes or mirror and copy paste, snap, transform them, move them around. Um, this is where we do like advanced things for grabbing and moving and changing keyframes. The other uh, window in our interface that we want to worry about is our graph editor. And the graph editor is what we use to see how uh, we interpolate, how we uh, transition from one keyframe to the next. So obviously here we've got the ball and it's moving around between each keyframe. So if I scrub over here under our properties, let's break this down, let's open this up. We've got all of our properties, X location, Y location, Z location, X, Y, Z rotation, X, Y, Z scale. In the properties of our um, shader color, we were changing the red, green, blue, and alpha for the colors of our material. Um, so I can pick out the keyframes here for anything. So I've got X location would be down here. So at frame one, our location is zero. And if I open up the little carrot on the left here, or on the right here rather, I can see that it is set to a value of zero. And as I scrub forward, pick another keyframe, that value will change. Pick another uh, keyframe, that value will change. Um, and we have handles here on these keyframes, and these handles are like the handles of a vector. Like if you've ever used Illustrator or Photoshop, use paths, it changes how we transition between keyframes. So now I've changed the, I've created like this S curve on this keyframe. So now if I look at my X axis, you can see that the ball swings way far out and then like cut curls back around. So in the x-axis here, the ball swings out, and I can actually exaggerate this a bunch if I want to to really make the point. Let's zoom out, exaggerate this. So the ball swings way out, and then quickly, rapidly, you can see how sharp in one keyframe, how sharp a transition it is. It jumps back and then like shoots over the x-axis and comes back again. And so the graph editor allows us to 
change how we transition between keyframes because um, you know you think about the the 12 principles of animation from Disney there are the uh, there's like spacing timing um, all that kind of thing even though we have keyframes we know exactly at what point in time the ball hits its marks how quickly it transitions like it accelerates or decelerates between those keyframes also affects how the animation feels um, so let's go ahead, get rid of all the clutter right now, and we'll just start working on our bouncing ball animation to help make things make more sense. So let's go ahead, let's go back to our dope sheet. I'm going to tap A to select all, X for delete, and click delete all keyframes, and I deleted all those keyframes. And in fact, I'm going to go to my markers here, and I'm going to delete those markers too. So, uh... Select this marker, delete marker, select this marker, delete marker. Yep, so now I've, I've reset everything, cleaned it up. Um, the only thing I want to do is, because I deleted the keyframes when my playhead was in the middle of the animation, it left the ball where it was sitting, you know, part weight animated. I'm just going to right click and reset all to default values. So I reset all of my uh, transforms to zero. And from the side, I'm just going to grab the ball and move it up. Um, if I don't, if I hold control, it will snap to the grid. If I don't hold control, it will kind of uh, move to any arbitrary value. So I'm going to hold control and snap it perfectly up by two, so it's perfectly sitting on the ground there. So I have a ball. I want to have it drop and bounce along the floor. So let's say it'll take a second to fall. So at frame 30 here, and I'll set this as my... Uh, I'll set this as my end keyframe, so let's go over here, let's set my end keyframe to maybe frame, let's frame 60, let's give it two seconds, because maybe we want the ball to like roll after it bounces. So at frame 30, one second into the animation, it will hit the floor, so I will now, I'll add a keyframe. Now I could go over here, hover over location, and tap I to, to add a keyframe, or if I'm just in the viewport and tap I, it will give me a bunch of uh, keyframe options. Some of these are a little weird, so yeah, we can either add a keyframe for location, rotation, or scale, add a combined keyframe for location and rotation, or location, rotation, and scale, location, scale, rotation, scale, basically two of each, all three of them. There's also delta and visual location keyframes. These are a little bit more advanced, more funny. Um, delta location means it won't save the absolute location of the object, it will only save um, how much the position changed. And this can be useful if you then go back to a previous keyframe and update it and say, like, I wanted this to be slightly further to the left, instead of having to make to go to every single keyframe and say every keyframe now needs to be this far extra to the left. A delta keyframe will say that it it's it will change the offset of the location. So if you change one one keyframe, it will then update all of the other keyframes with the same offset. Um, the visual ones, that's a little bit more weird. Um, you, That's advanced, we're not going to cover that, just to avoid confusion. Um, the delta keyframes can be useful, but again, avoiding confusion, we'll kind of set that to the side for right now. Um, for right now, all we want to do is add a keyframe for location, and you'll see that these turn yellow, and now we have a keyframe in here for our XYZ. Cool. So let's scrub back to frame one and move this up in the air, like 1.8. That's fine. Add location. Cool. And so now, between these two keyframes, it animates. By default, our default interpolation mode, uh, interpolation is, you know, the way that we transition between keyframes, um, automatically it does uh, a smooth transition, a, a uh, Bezier transition, um, where it eases between the two points. Um, if I wanted to instead have a linear transition between these two keyframes, like it's moving at a constant velocity, I could set it to linear, and then we have it move at a constant speed down to the ground. Um, by default, Blender doesn't use linear 
it uses Bezier, because in most cases, having an object um, slowly accelerate and then slowly decelerate at the end of its motion feels more natural. So having it start to accelerate and then slow down feels more natural. However, in this case, for a bouncing ball, you'd expect it to accelerate quickly and then suddenly stop at the bottom. So we wouldn't want it to uh, transition out of it. It wouldn't want it uh, to accelerate and then decelerate. We want it to accelerate and then stop immediately. So we'll change that in the graph editor momentarily. But let's cover some of these other ones. So we've got um, different easing. So instead of just the automatic Bezier where it automatically makes the most smooth transition between all the keyframes, you could have it do something like have it go faster. Uh, use a quadratic, cubic, quartic, exponential, um, or sinusoidal um, acceleration curve. These are basically just different steepnesses of acceleration um, parabolas. Um, and then we also have dynamic effects. These dynamic effects are kind of fun. So if I go to the first keyframe here, have it selected, so it's yellow for selected, and I change the keyframe here to bounce, and then hit play, you see that the ball actually seems to bounce exactly like we want it to. And if we go to the graph editor, we'll see what it's done is actually create the curves to have it automatically bounce a couple times before it stops at the keyframe. Now, something I will point out, we set the bounce effect to the first keyframe, not the last keyframe. Intuitively, you might think, oh, I want it to bounce when it hits the ground, so I'll pick the keyframe where it's hitting the ground and tell that to be um, the bounce effect. But no, you want it to be the first keyframe, and the reason for that is the final keyframe basically tells you where the object is coming to rest. The first keyframe that you're transitioning into the second keyframe tells you how you're going to get there, how you're going to transition to that resting state. So we want to click the first one and tell it that we want to bounce before we come to rest at the second keyframe. Um, the bounce interpolation mode bounce here. If we go to our graph editor and pick pick the uh, pick the keyframes here, we can see under under our uh, F curves over here. Let's even let's expand this up a little bit more. Let's so we can see it easier. Under our F curves here, we can see that the active keyframe that we have selected, this first keyframe, if I click the second one, it's just set to Bezier. If I click this one, the first one, it's set to bounce. We can change some things. So we could change uh, the value of the keyframe, you know, where how high the uh, the ball is, and we can change the easing mode for the bounce. So we can have it ease in, ease out, ease in and out, automatic easing, which is basically the same kind of thing of is it accelerating in or accelerating out of the bounce. Um, and for some of the other dynamic effects, like uh, an elastic effect, you can change. Uh, how many times it does this like rubber band snap as it you know settles to this point in the middle, um, and how tall those bounces are as it snaps back to the middle, or the uh, the back where it sort of like overshoots and then comes back to the point. How far it overshoots before it settles back to the point, which is pretty cool. The bounce just sort of does its its own like automatic exponential um, recovery thing, um, but let's go ahead and let's maybe let's maybe tweak this. So we got this bounce, which is kind of cool. I kind of like it, but let's let's maybe let's maybe do this by hand to like really point out how to do this sort of animation stuff. So we'll change this back to Bezier, and we get the uh, our vector handles again. So let's grab the uh, the last handle, and under key, let's change the handle type to, let's say, or the easing type, hmm, let's think about this. Interpolation mode, maybe set this one to linear, or no, that would be linear coming out of it, so maybe let's set this 
handle type to vector. Yeah, there we go. And then it creates a, a snapping slope as it comes into it. So we want the ball to accelerate down to the ground and then come to a, a sudden stop. So that works. Because now we got our vector handle, which means it's like broken the handles and it created the vector um, at a tangent to the uh, to the curve. So now let's, as we play the animation, it will like accelerate quickly into the ground and then stop at the bottom, like suddenly stop at the bottom. So it's like gravity, gravity is catching it and then it stops. Now it's a little bit slow because it takes a second to get there. So maybe let's grab this and move the keyframe along. Um, we can move it freely, grab with G and move it freely, or tap X to just move it in the X axis, not in the Y axis of the graph. Let's maybe make this take uh, half a second, 15 frames instead. But now we can see that this vector handle is a little bit too steep, so it's going to like sit there and then like plummet. So let's move that handle down, grab the other keyframe, maybe move that handle over. Let's see if this looks more natural. That looks pretty natural. Ball accelerates and then comes to a quick stop at the bottom. Maybe that's a little bit too gradual. So let's maybe move this keyframe in, get this handle in so it smooths out that acceleration as we head towards the ground. Um, what we can also do is scale it so the ball squishes when it hits the ground. So like fundamentals of animation, um, squash and stretch, uh, a rubber ball wouldn't just like, uh, maybe a hard squash ball would like hit rigidly like this, but a, a soft to kid's toy might squash and stretch and rebound as it bounces along. So maybe, maybe let's try that. I'm going to go to the side, scale along the z-axis, scale it down, Grab in the Z axis and then move it down to touch the ground again. And I'll tap I, and this time I'll do location scale, lock scale. Have both of those. Um, and here you can see I made a mistake. I didn't set a keyframe for the ball to be fully scaled at frame one. So we'll actually go over here and make sure that the ball is fully scaled at frame one. So location scale. Update that. And now let's take a look. And oh no, the ball squishes before it touches the ground. That looks awkward. So we can fix this. Again, let's go to our, our handles here. Now the graphs are getting a little bit complicated now because now we got XYZ scaling as well as our, our Z position. So we can use the little eyeballs to show and hide different properties. So our Z scale here is what we want to change, our up and down scaling, and our Z location uh, is what we're moving up and down. So let's hide everything but our scale for the moment. Just want to see the ball squish. So the ball squishing should only start uh, just before it hits the ground. So let's move this keyframe over until, let's see when the balls would be hitting the ground. The ball will be hitting the ground around frame 15. Let's move this handle over to like frame 15. And then as it squishes into the floor, we'll have it transition into that squish. So it falls and squish. Now that looks like it loses a lot of its momentum as it does that. It just sort of moves, stops, and then squishes. So that doesn't feel right. Um, and actually, the reason for that might be we added an extra keyframe in here, didn't we? Yeah, we did. When we set um, location and scale for our keyframe, we accidentally added another keyframe here. So let's go ahead, delete that keyframe for our uh, Z location, and make this look better again. So let's go ahead, see how the ball falls. Again, ball squishing too soon, so maybe around frame 25. Let's make it scale... Start squishing frame 25, maybe? Ball comes down, squish. Ball comes down, squish. It's looking better. Maybe a little bit slow, but better. Let's maybe make it move down faster. Ah, change this handle so it hits the ground faster. More suddenly, 
And we'll have the squish also be much more abrupt and sudden. Ball will just suddenly squish. So as we play through the timeline here, we'll just focus on the end. It hits the ground and squish. Maybe let's maybe even move the squish over to as it hits the ground. So like one frame before, and then it will continue for a couple frames. Like hits the ground, squish, or let's see how this looks. Squish, squish. Eh. Rapid squish. Five frames squish, rapid squish. Keep it size really for a while, and then let's see, squish. Squish. So it falls and squishes. In this top keyframe, I've accidentally scaled it down a little bit. Let's set it back to one. Tap I to make sure it's set to one. I accidentally pulled it down a little bit, so let's let's see. Ball will squish as it hits the ground. Crunch. Crunch. Um but even that feels a little flat. Let's maybe make this like cartoony. Let's exaggerate the falling animation by having it stretch and then squish. So we'll have it start off flat at the top. Then as it starts to accelerate, let's maybe add a keyframe here. And we'll use this to make it stretch as it falls. And in fact, we can delete this keyframe and maybe have the stretch turn into the squish. So it stretches, it falls, and then it will squish. The stretch and squish, stretch and squish. So it'll fall, stretch and squish, stretch and squish. And we'll have this handle determine when it squishes. Stretch and squish, stretch and squish. I'm liking this. Maybe have it squish faster, or squish slower and then squish faster. There we go. Stretch and squish. And then let's make it bounce off. So we're going to bounce, let's say, a third of a second, 10 frames. Uh, which way we want it to bounce? Have it bounce. Well, let's have it moving forward so it's not just. Uh, well, we'll just have it bounce straight up for the minute. So, frame 40, let's have it move back up a little bit. Not quite as high as before, obviously, because it's going to have lost some energy. So, we'll set a keyframe there. You can see that I have my Z scale um, keyframe selected, so it's bright, but I still updated. The location in the background, which is sort of grayed out to kind of hide itself. So now we'll see it'll come down, hit the ground. Oh, but it's overshooting and then coming up. We don't want it to overshoot under the ground. That's a problem. So what we can do with that is we can move our handles. Now the handles here are connected because of their interpolation mode, but I can go to my keys change my handle type to maybe free handles, and now this handle will be detached from the under handle, other handle, so we can change that handle. So we can have it come rapidly to the bottom, and then rapidly bounce up to the top. So let's see how that looks. Rapidly boing, boing. Maybe that like floats in the air for too long. Boing. Boing. Maybe it bounces too quickly, so we could change the handle on that. Maybe take a little bit longer to get up in the air. Boing, boing. As it heads up to the top of its travel, it should stretch again. So let's make the ball stretch again. Tap I. Same problem here. It's going to like scale too much, or yeah, it'll be, like scale and then like scale inside out before stretching. So let's, again, grab this keyframe, change the handle type 
to free handles and move this one. So it will boing, 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 maybe even faster. I have it stretch more when it reaches the top. Boing, boing, maybe even quicker. Boing. And then frame 50. Let's move it back down to the ground again. And we'll scale it, squish it back down again. Maybe that's too squished. Maybe slightly less squish. We'll do like three bounces. This will be a less powerful bounce, so it squishes less when it hits the ground. has less momentum. So we'll see. Hits the ground, bounces up. Uh, maybe stretches a little bit too much at the top there. The top of its travel. In fact, at the top of its travel, it should be like one for scale. But we'll use this one to have it stretch as it reaches the top and then slow down. And then it will stretch again as it hits the ground. So again, scale. Turn off location for a second. Grab this handle. Set the keyframe to... Set my right handle, maybe instead of automatically, yeah, let's set the right handle to free. Maybe make it stretch again as it, reach, as it heads towards the ground. And as it reaches the ground, again, and I can tap V, as in victor, or victory, uh, to change it. Free handles, grab. Hits the ground, squishes a little bit. Stretch and squish. Let's play this. See how this is work. How this is going. Stretch and bounce. Boing. 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 And we'll do. One last little bounce. In fact, that might take. Might need like 80 keyframes here. One last little bounce. Move it up a little bit. Keyframe the position. Squish, and then it comes up. And then frame 70. Comes back down. And at that point, it's solid. And then in midair, it does stretch a little bit. Set the keyframe in the middle of midair. Go to the scale. It's going to stretch a little bit as it goes up. Boing. Stretch way less because it's got almost no energy left. Comes up. And then, and then down to the ground. Up, and then down. And so now let's take a look at this animation. Let's move my camera around. Bring this down a little bit so I can actually see what's happening. Play, boing, boing, boing. Boing, boing, boing. Now it looks a little bit stiff and awkward. The timing there isn't quite perfect. Um, this is not the best animation in the world. Um, I'm not. I tend to do mechanical animations for um, like training previs stuff. I don't tend to do a lot of um, soft animations or character animations and things like that. So um, my animation skills for things like this are not the best in the world. I'm primarily a modeler. Um, do a little bit of animation work for on contract for um, like security devices and things, but. Yeah, 
it's serviceable, and it gives you an introduction to the basic tools for uh, animating inside a Blender, um, changing your, your timing and your keyframes on the graph to make custom animations. And I could do the same thing here for any of the properties. So if I went in and I wanted it to change color as it's playing along, I can add a keyframe in here for color, hide the transforms, scroll along when it hits the ground the first time, changes to blue, second time, change to green, and then as it's falling, it'll change color. And again, you got all the same... For RGB, you've got all the same handles. You could break those handles as free handles and have them do their own funky things if you wanted them to. So it could turn to blue and then snap to like dark green, then back to green. All kinds of crazy stuff. Boing, boing, boing. That's a basic introduction to the most fundamental aspects of animating inside a Blender. You've got your, your dope sheet there, so you can get an idea of you know, all your keyframes. Um, all your properties. You got your timeline there for like your mo very, very most basic like playback. And then when you're trying to do super advanced hand animated stuff. You've got, let's hide these for a second, you got your dope sheet where you can play with your graphs and create like manual transitions for your animations. Now, if I wanted to save this out as a sequence, um, first thing I need to do obviously is I need a camera in the scene, so I'll add a camera, and I'm going to use the photographer add-on um, that I mentioned in the addendum to uh, last week's uh, workshop to set up our, our exposure settings. I'm going to go ahead and shrink things down here for a second so I can actually see what I'm doing. I'm going to go into my camera view. I'm going to do shift tilde so I can go into free fly and then use my WASD keys like a first person shooter to move the camera around. Find a decent camera angle. Um, let's change this back to just the basic timeline so I can see what's what. Um, and let's view Ah, actually, here's something I, I forgot to point out. So the timeline only shows you keyframes for the objects that you have currently selected. Um, And so that's something where if you've got a bunch of objects and a bunch of things being animated, you might want to go over to your dope sheet, because the dope sheet, um, while by default it does the same thing by only showing you only selected, you can toggle that on and off and show you and get a visualization of everything, uh, all your keyframes in the timeline, not just on selected objects. Um, you can also display hidden objects and all kinds of stuff, which is, is useful for like filtering what you're looking at depending on what you need. Um, so I'm going to use the dope sheet right here as our timeline. So ball falls hits the ground, boing, boing, boing. Um, I want the camera to at least see its starting position. Ball falls, hits, boing, boing, boing. Works for me. Um, in terms of exposure, let's go down here. Maybe change my shutter speed. Let's change it to angles, 180 degree angle. Let's have it affect motion blur, affect depth of field, render settings, let's use motion blur, 16 samples, and the shutter there should be determined by my motion blur shutter, should be determined by the angle. Let's see my false colors, how's that looking? Grays and greens looking decent, maybe a little bit underexposed, but let's maybe change my Put the field down here to oh my, my f stops down here like f1.8. Set my focal position to there. If I tap f12 just to see a preview render out of Eevee, that looks pretty good. 
and then I can go to my output, change the output. I'm going to go to the virtual classes. I'm going to make a new folder, and I'm going to call this uh, uh, workshop anim. And, it's, and in that folder, I'm going to name this. The name here is going to be the name of the file, Blender Anim Workshop 6. Hit accept. Um, and now I have a, a few choices of file format. My personal preference is to use an image sequence, whether that's uh, JPEG, PNG Targa. Um, PNG is like the best compromise between um, visual quality and file size. Um, JPEG, you lose a, a bunch of file quality, but you save a bunch of file size. Um, Targa and a few of the others, you gain a bunch of quality and bit depth, but you lose in terms of um, file size. Your files get pretty big pretty fast. Um, so I tend to use PNG. And I tend to do PNG image sequences instead of like saving out an AVI or an uh, MP4, an MPEG file, because it gives you redundancy. Um, so if you're rendering out an image sequence on a big animation project and Blender crashes or Windows decides it's going to force a restart or you have a brownout or a blackout for a little while, you won't lose any progress. Uh, as you're rendering frame by frame, each frame that finishes will be saved into your folder um, and you will have all of your progress up to that point saved, which when you're doing a big, heavy VFX shot or something like that, where you're taking 30 seconds, a minute, several minutes per frame to render out each frame of a long animation, hours and hours of rendering, you don't want one little mishap to then cost you all of that time and you lose all of your progress. That is heartbreaking. It's happened to me before, and I learned my lesson to never let it happen again. If I were saving out, um, if I were saving as a, an AVI or an MPEG, where it's saving a video file, it's basically all or nothing. You either save out the whole video file or you lose the whole video file. If you're saving an image sequence, every frame that renders is its own separate image, and then you can take that into DaVinci Resolve or After Effects or whatever, and then string that together into um, you know, your final M MP4 video. But if anything happens, a crash, a power outage, whatever, you don't lose your progress. So personally, um, I prefer to save out image sequences, um, and that saves me a lot of headache. The other thing is, if you ever want to like go back and update an animation, like uh, you get a client who says, hey, um, around six seconds in, I want this to the, uh, rotate to the left instead of rotate to the right, um, I can have this overwrite check mark marked and say okay at, at you know frame 30 i'm going to change the animation update the frame after 30 and then only render and overwrite those frames and it will overwrite those images in my folder but it then won't i don't have to save out an entire new file and render the entire animation all over again i can just overwrite the file the frames that got updated and not overwrite the frames that i don't need to update um, so it's a little bit of like redundancy efficiency um, there's pretty much no downsides to saving an image sequence except potentially file sizes. Um, but yeah, let's, we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, and so I'll go ahead, cut the recording here, um, render out the animation, and then I'll tag it onto the end of the, uh, the, uh, the video as, you know, a demonstration of what we accomplished in this week's workshop. Um, so thanks everybody for tuning in and, uh, uh, leave any questions below. Thanks.